This is a question that was submitted uh, by Rachel, who's an undergrad here at Stanford. And um, the question is, were you ever scared in pursuing your ambitions or doubt yourself in the process? And if so, how did you overcome those fears? And I'll let anyone answer that who wants to take it. I'm guessing the answer is yes. Yeah, the short answer is yes. yes. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example. Yeah. Um, I really didn't want to start this company. I think that, that I ended up doing it because I felt like the world really needed it, but I was really just intimidated by the business side. I knew how to build product and I knew how to make something desirable, but the whole, num it's not that I can't do math, it's just what it represented was something that felt very alien to me. Um, possibly because I have a, a lot of family that's in the investment banking community and I had seen that side of the world and I was like, I am not that. So there was an entire identity transformation that kind of I had to work out. Um, it took, I did my master's thesis my second year of Stanford. I launched this company my fourth year of Stanford. So I had to really um, realize that it was something that I needed to do, not I wanted to do <clears throat> for me. It wasn't about being an entrepreneur. It was bringing life to this idea that I really felt needed to exist. Yeah, I, I would say my example that I thought of was, um, you know, we started writing uh, small business innovation research grants. And um, I, I wrote this grant, which I thought was just, it, that was a really great grant application for the National Science Foundation and submitted it um, and it came back and we, we didn't get it. And we ended up in the interim before we heard back, we had, we had filled out like seven or eight grant applications and they ended up all, ended up not getting any of those. And it was, it was this very disheartening moment. It's like, oh my God, like we're not getting these grant applications. So then um, kind of had to regroup from that and then took in um, like the reviewers comments. And then it was like after our, like our eighth or ninth application, uh, we basically would get them, we got like three in a row, uh, three of these grants. And now our, our hit rate for grants is um, like over 50%, which is pretty high for these, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people writing these grants. Um, and it was just a matter of like just getting, like doing it and getting the feedback, incorporating that feedback into the grant application, just resubmitting. And then um, after a while, just kind of understanding um, how, again, how to tell that story. I think someone mm -hmm. mentioned that earlier, like, like our initial grant applications were too scientific. We were writing it too much like, like manuscripts. And so being able to tell how the techno-economics fit into our technical work plan and how that would um, bring the cost down for our customers, like telling that story was really important. I think for, I think for us, um, the biggest challenge that we faced was early on we were working with drones and we were actually going to retrofit our own drones and then do the inspections ourselves. And we found out that not only is that um, very capital intensive, but at the same time, there were so many regulations that we were going to have to face as well. And that was going to be a really long uphill battle. So trying to decide whether or not we were going to pivot and just become a software company or also, um, and then partner with drone companies or stick to um, this like like drone retrofitting business as well was a big uh, challenge for us. And we faced that like month three or month four of our business. So uh, I think that was the scariest thing that um, I faced as a new entrepreneur, but I think it was a great learning experience. Kat or Joan, either of you want to? Well, I would say yes. The, anyone <laughs> would lie who doesn't say that they have doubts and are afraid and uh, unsure. So. You know, one of the things that I do when I have such doubts, you know, to your point, Tasha, is I bring my team close, you know, and we kind of, uh, you know, regroup. But an another thing that I do is I go see customers, you know, and I do talk about, I talk, talk to the people who, who really do have a need for, for what we're innovating with. And so that kind of gives me new energy and helps me work through that crummy period also. So um, I think... Uh running mission-oriented um, companies, you often have to speak the truth when people really are un uncomfortable hearing it, internally and externally. So I don't remember when I started putting almost every speech I give about the bank, which is maybe 100 a year, that we have to wrestle with the fact that this country was founded on slavery, native genocide, and less than personhood for half the people. 
And the first couple of times I said that, even my own family is like, do you really have to say that? <laughs> but we really do have to say that um, and wrestle with it. And then we're in a regulated industry, so it's super scary to have outside authorities who can shut you down if you don't do it right. Um, and it's hard to do it right. We're 10 and a half years old, so we have made some mistakes along the way. Um, and even on the ranch side, we, we were part, caught up in a, a recall of beef at a facility in Petaluma for us, a year's worth of beef. It was just a showstopper. So blank happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, let's see if there are any questions from the audience before I turn back to some of these other. We have a microphone if anybody wants to. Okay, we have, well, actually, we'll start here and then we'll go to the one in the back just because this is closer. <laughs> This is, this is also a question for everybody up here, and I'm curious, as sustainability entrepreneurs, how much each of you think about working with the ecosystem around your company as much as you think about working to make your company specifically successful? And any sort of examples that you have about that, whether that's policy or working in a collaborative environment with other people in the same supply chain? I can start again. Yeah, I definitely... Um, do both for, I hope for the benefit of this, the ecosystem, but also for us as well. Like I, I'm, um, you know, help out with certain nonprofits that have a kind of uh, more global mission of CO2 utilization and CO2 um, removal and decreasing. Kind of, I try to speak on behalf of kind of uh, industry as a whole, not just my own my own company. And um, I certainly try to uh, be on as, on panels as, as I can. You know, I, um, I uh, have to regulate that a little bit to make sure I can still. Um, do the work of the company. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's really good to kind of see what's on the horizon. So like, for example, there's this new law that, that this Congress passed, uh, surprisingly, that uh, was surprising to me, I should say that, um, but it's called 45Q, where you, uh, companies can now get a tax credit um, for <coughs> utilizing or sequestering their CO2. Um, and so, you know, being in that ecosystem and knowing that was being worked on and then kind of hearing that it got passed, um, you know, so that's like really helpful for our company because that, now that's like something else we can tell our, our future customers that like, hey, well, you can get this tax credit in addition to the revenue that we can generate from using your CO2. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's a give and take and, and um, I like to just pay things forward and kind of get good karma points and um, also too on the in entrepreneurship front, like if, um, you know, if people have questions and want to ask me about a specific fellowship or something that I've been a part of, I'm happy to, to help and give strategic advice. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 please. We absolutely depend on our ecosystem because our mission is to change the banking system for good. And same is true in ranching and energy. So we can't do that alone. We aren't even the intermediary that can make that happen. We're the change bank that can show a model that works. And then we really work hard to convince the large regional banks that they should act more like us to change the whole system. So that's disciplining the supply chain. And arguably, that's what we're doing in the food and energy space as well. It's not good enough to be a good bank in a bad system. Go ahead, Sam. Well, I, I also heavily rely on the supply chain effects within the industries that we're working in. And one of the big interesting things is that I might actually find the value to the customer is actually different in different parts of the supply chain. So for the person preparing food and, and selling it at the point of sale, they're concerned about wastage and spoilage and how much of something and not losing a sale. But there's also an intermediary who makes their big risk is actually based on the amount of working capital that's disposable to them. And so all of a sudden, our value is in helping them be able to match one end of their customer base with their other end of their customer base. And that's a really you know, it's the same product, but it's solving their problem in a different way. And so understanding that full ecosystem actually has given me access to a different kind of customer than I initially expected to have. So I, I strongly support like really getting to know just like the full complexity of the space that you're in. Great. We have a question back there. Yeah. Good afternoon. My, is this on? Yep. 
Okay. Um, my name is Rainy Chang. I'm with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, government agency. Um, so I appreciate all of your comments about connecting to funders and investors and customers and building out a team. Um, and I'm glad Kat raised the, the issue of government as well. I think in a lot of cases, government is interested in working towards a lot of these positive goals in collaboration with the private sector, um, though I think there is a reputation of regulations being in the way. So I'm curious to hear um, from all of you on what you see the opportunities, uh, what you see as the opportunities with partnering uh, with, with governments to achieve some of these goals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel uh, regulation for us has been a big challenge, um, given that uh, like the line of sight regulation is really um, strict right now in the U.S. in particular for um, using helicopters and drones. Um, and so currently the uh, line of sight regulation, they're actually trying to work to get um, clearance for multiple drone companies for the purpose of inspections of infrastructures so that um, they can allow drones to go in and use sensors and actually become... Um, much closer to the line to detect more of the um, overall problems with the health of the line. And so for us, that's been a matter of working with um, not only the utilities, but also working um, with the government and the utilities together to try and figure out the best way to um, come to this conclusion, whether or not that is letting um, certain inspection companies have clearance or whether uh, that is uh, required training that allows you to go through um, like to circumvent the line of sight regulation. I think that's been something for us that we're hoping in the next year or two is going to become even more flexible because that would uh, greatly help the amount of um, inspections, not only in power lines, but also for mining and for gas and pipeline inspections. Uh, the possibilities are endless for using drones for those types of um, uh, inspections. So that's, that's our hope working with the government and the utilities together, we can come to a much quicker solution. We embrace our regulators. They're really important to us uh, because banking is not just a financial service industry. We actually are a, an arm of law enforcement and a part of uh, constitutional rights. So um, in addition to be, having to operate safely and soundly to, as an uh, entrusted steward of deposits and the banking system, which we see what happens if it is threatened, it's a showstopper. Um, we have to maintain fair lending. So that's access to credit is tantamount in any capitalist society. And we're one of the few safeguarders of it. We have done it imperfectly over time. There was a period of shameful redlining in this country. So you need not look too far back to see what happens when you don't warrant fair lending. Fair lending is super important. Any money laundering right now in the six West Coast states that have all legalized marijuana or cannabis, um, we are awash in a cash industry that's unregulated as to money laundering. It's not that cannabis is the criminal element, it's the other criminal elements coming into an open cash system. So we're working really hard to try to figure out how to solve that. It's very important, it's a huge threat to public safety. Um, also, uh, cybersecurity and data breaches, uh, the banks are actually the most armed to fight against those. So we set an example. We're not perfect. You see big breaches, but you see them more in the big box retailers and stuff. So regulation is really important to us. And it's not just a, a kind of defensive posture like, oh, we have to do that too. So that's a multi-stakeholder model, right? We're serving a lot of different constituents there. But it's also a proactive opportunity. So we are the bank lending into the subsidy provided by, by the California Air Resource Board for low to moderate income borrowers to buy uh, clean vehicles hybrid and electric vehicles, $5 million. We'll put a lot of vehicle, clean vehicles on the road in just the right hands. We're trying to put more and different people in charge. We're starting at the bottom of the pyramid. Those are the people who should be getting the chance to drive those vehicles first. So I'm not afraid of regulation. I, there's such a thing as efficient, but it, it's a great process of serving a multi-stakeholder community. I'd add to that just quickly that uh, regulation is our friend too in that the uh, the state uh, livestock and dairy industry is facing SB 1383, which is uh, a new law that requires the dairy and livestock industries to reduce their methane emissions by 40% by 2030. And it seems incredible, uh, very difficult to attain goal to producers. But for, from our standpoint, um, it has been very useful in uh, working with uh, livestock producers to get them talking about, well, what would it take? And, and you know, how could we work together with, uh, you know, with the industry and, and with uh, government and um, 
you know, with the food system overall to try to try to meet those those tough goals. So it's been a catalyst for productive conversation. We have a question in the back. Um, th thank you all so much for sharing your uh, advice, your stories, and your uh, motivation with us all going forward. Uh, I have a question that it might land more so in where Joan and Kat work, but you know, please anyone who has some thoughts on this would be fantastic to hear. I'm I'm curious how you beat the projects that have you know 10 plus you know 20 year 30 year time delays before you actually start to see that real like deep impact and societal change aspect to it. It's so difficult to proof concept in that regard and. I'm curious how you all approach that, if you try to kind of beat the time delay or if it's something that you kind of accept and bake in and Kat, as you said, you know, just be honest with that mission element up front. I'd, I'd love to hear any advice you have on that going forward. And thank you. I think Kat mentioned earlier that um, the position she's in does allow her and, and Tom some patience. And I think there are people who have the luxury uh, to um, to be able to take long-term risks and other people who, who really can't probably um, productively manage that. Uh, I think that those people who can uh, either themselves or with a, a partner, an investor who has that patience, you know, who can take a long-term bet should definitely seek to do that because those kind of long systemic type changes that change not only the one business but the entire industry in the case of, of Beneficial Bank and uh, and others, that those kinds of really disruptive and long-term changes need to be uh, made room for in concert with the short-term things that, that we might be able to um, achieve to get some impact. And I actually, um, so it is hard for everybody to take that long-term view, but we have a lot of different types of capital and a lot of different types of return. So what I mean by a lot of different types of capital, people are really reimagining, for instance, the humble municipal bond. It's an awesome instrument because of uh, all sorts of improvements, including blockchain. We might actually get the minimums for municipal bonds way down so a lot more people could invest in them. A lot more institutional investors could be comfortable with them. And they might be better directed at long-term uh sort of capital improvements for society, like bike trails and pollution mitigation and workforce housing. Um, and the re type of return, so the Global Alliance for Banking on Values represents 46 banks internationally that have always been directed by values. Some of them, we're one of them, but some of them are much bigger, much longer standing than us. And they've been trying to make the argument that they are literally a different asset class than the other banks. The volatility of return on banks is ginormous. I mean, it looks like a roller coaster. It, it exacerbates the cycle, the economic cycles. And the, our economic cycles are out of whack. They're, they're much more volatile than we experienced in the, you know, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the depression accepted. But the, um, um, so I think what their thesis is that now over a 10-year period that they've been measuring, they return 8 to 10% return on equity like clockwork. That's really good. The lack of volatility is really good. Volatility, it's hard to imagine what volatility is good for otherwise. And it's really good for the underlying business activities too because finance is the basis of business formation and uh, time intermediation. It's a, it's a really important function. But at the turn of the last Great Recession in 2007, I think, uh, uh, financial services represented 25% of GDP. That's a surcharge. Because finance doesn't actually do anything. It allocates capital, that's important, but it isn't a product or a service per se that we should dedicate that much of GDP to. So I think it's time to rethink a lot of these financial principles about uh, what is return, what's the return you seek, what is risk capital. These large insurance and reinsurance companies have a totally different time frame and um, profile You know the premium flow that they see is much more um, matched to long-term results. So they might be a source of some help. And then the custodial accounts. You hear a lot of talk about public banking right now. It's really a rethink of public finance. And it isn't like a bank owned in the public by the public is the best solution for everything, but we should really think hard about what it is good for. Maybe it's infrastructure finance. Uh, maybe it's for 
bridging to uh, the legalization of cannabis at the federal level. You know, whatever it is, we should think outside of the box about that uh, because so far finance has been killing us recently. So we are basically out of time. There will be time at a reception after to um, ask questions and um, have conversation with our panelists and speakers. But I want to ask one more question that was submitted for Atasha uh, by a community <laughs> member, Jan, um, which is one of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> one of the aims I think that you'd articulated at Opus 12 was um, using something about Mars. And of course that captures people's attention. So the question is how would converted carbon dioxide be used on Mars to make products from recycled materials? Oh yeah. So um, one little fun fact is that 95% of the atmosphere on Mars is actually carbon dioxide. Um, so we literally can mine the atmosphere of Mars and make plastic. Uh, we can make um, we can make diesel fuel. We can make methane, which methane is kind of the fuel of choice for um, for rockets, so ro specifically rockets that would go to Mars and a, ro and a rocket that would come from Mars back to Earth. Um, so you can imagine sending our unit to Mars uh, ahead of any astronauts and just have it producing this uh, methane fuel that the astronauts would then use to uh, come back to Earth. Or they would use it on Mars to go travel around. So uh, we've actually gotten a grant from NASA, which has been great, um, to, to actually um, make plastics um, on Mars. So I mean, it's, it's you know it's an early stage development grant. We're not going to be sending our things to Mars anytime soon, but uh, it's the first first few steps to get us there. So we're really excited about that. Okay, thank you to all of these inspirational women for coming and spending time with us this afternoon telling us about their stories and thank you all for being here uh, today with us. And we are holding a reception that's outside the building um, on the Sarah Mall side. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again.